noget som styrer op til nu. <laughs> so hello everyone and a really warm welcome um, to the School of Geographical and Earth Sciences um, annual Christmas lecture here at the University of Glasgow. Um, my name is Sherwin Deacon um, and I'm a senior lecturer in human geography here in the school and the head of the geography degree program and I'm delighted to be here um, with my colleague John today who's going to introduce himself. Hi everyone, uh, my name is John McDonald. Uh, I'm a lecturer in earth science and I'm also the programme leader for our environmental geoscience undergraduate programme. Thanks John, uh, and we're really delighted to be here today uh, to talk with you about some of the most fundamental issues of our time and ones that both John and I are actively involved um, in researching and teaching. And today we're going to be thinking about building hopeful um, world, building hopeful futures in relation to issues of climate change and climate justice. And we want to share with you ways in which thinking through these issues from a geographical and a geoscientist perspective um, helps to give insight into how you might study some of these subjects here um, at university. Now, the lecture itself will run for about 40 minutes um, and then afterwards we'll have a QA and a discussion um, where you can ask questions whether it's about the content of the lecture or just questions you might have about studying either geography um, or earth sciences um, here at Glasgow. Um, so we hope you really enjoy being with us this afternoon for the lecture and I'll now hand over first to John who's going to talk to you about climate change. Okay, thanks so much, Cheryl. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk for um, a wee while about uh, kind of maybe some more scientific aspects of climate change before I then hand back to Cheryl to talk about climate justice. So, of course, the big challenge of our time, as we all know, and really highlighted in the news recently with, with COP26 being here in Glasgow, is atmospheric carbon dioxide, CO2 concentrations have risen higher than they've ever been um, in recent geological time, and that's due to human activity. So we can see this on this uh, graph here, going back several hundred thousand years, where the zigzag line is essentially changes in the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. And we can see at the right hand end of that line, which is the present day, that's now gone much higher than it's been for a long period. And as scientists, we can also model what's going to happen with CO2 in the atmosphere in the future. And so this graph from the IPCC shows some projections of what atmospheric con CO2 concentration might be like going towards the end of the current century. So of course there's different scenarios here based on what actions we take to try and mitigate climate change, um, ranging from you know, taking really strong action, which will give us maybe the lower of the lines here, the one labeled B1, or if we just kind of carry on business as usual, or maybe even worse, emitting more and more carbon dioxide, then we'll be on this red line labeled A1 Fi up towards the top right of the graph. So the challenge is really clear that we need to try and reduce the amount of CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere. Now, of course, there's many different ways we can do this. Um, things that we hear a lot about is all about reducing our emissions. So that could come from various sources. Um, so, for example, energy generation. So there's been a lot, uh, a big move um, in Scotland and the UK and many parts of the world from fossil fuels towards renewable energy sources, which, of course, emit a lot less carbon dioxide. There are various other sectors, uh, things like agriculture, um, which result in a lot of CO2 emissions. Also other greenhouse gases, so things like methane. And so, you know, you hear a bit about, you know, people talking about, you know, transitioning from a meat-based diet to a plant-based diet. Um, so less, less agricultural activity, less, less uh, meat production and farming, and that can reduce the CO2 emissions um, through, through agriculture. Industrial activity um, can be a big source of CO2 emissions as well. Um, for example, things like uh, making cement, um, also making steel. These, both of these industries, along with many others, emit excuse me, huge amounts of carbon dioxide. But you know, these are, are you know, key products that we need for you know, the continuation of, of life as we know it, essentially. So reducing CO2 emissions for all of these things is 
difficult. Um, you know, I think we've done a lot so far in terms of the what we might call the low-hanging fruit, so the kind of easy gains to be made in reducing our CO2 emissions. But, you know, these things are difficult both politically, um, financially, they can be potentially quite expensive. And also, I think, you know, kind of human nature, you know, so let's take something like flying, for example. You know, you've got family in New Zealand, and we just say, actually, I'm sorry, no, we're not going to have any flying anymore because it emits too much CO2. So you can't go and see your auntie in New Zealand. Yeah. So, you know, that's, let's face it, human nature. You know, we don't want to do these things. Now, it is very important to do everything we can to reduce our CO2 emissions. But there are other approaches that we can take, um, perhaps where we as geoscientists uh, can get involved a bit more. And that's looking at ways of actively taking CO2 out of the atmosphere that's already there. So this is referred to as carbon capture and storage. So something I'm sure you may well have heard about or read about. Um, so it's known as CCS, carbon capture and storage. Sometimes you hear it referred to as carbon capture utilization and storage, so CCUS. But a kind of very basic flow chart here, there is a starting point where we capture CO2, either from where it's being produced or CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. And then we can maybe transport it to somewhere where it can be stored. So safely stored away that that CO2 gas cannot then um, contribute to climate change. However, we may then transport it somewhere where it can be utilized. So maybe actually reused for some kind of useful process, or it can be utilized at the point at which it's captured. So let's look at these different stages um, in a wee bit more detail. So we start with the capture phase. Um, one way we could do this is capturing CO2 as we're emitting it. Now that works quite well if you've got a sort of single source where you're emitting a large amount of CO2. So something like, for example, a coal-fired power station, perhaps. Um, so the CO2 can be captured at source, and then through maybe a kind of complex process of purification, um, it can then be utilized or transported somewhere, and ultimately can be stored as well. And so this works well in areas where there's sort of high concentration of um, industry, which are significant CO2 emitters. Um, now, of course, we're kind of closing down our, our coal-fired power stations now, which is good, but there are other industries such as petrochemicals, maybe, um, which emit a lot of CO2 as well, where this kind of approach could be helpful. <coughs> the other approach that we can take to capturing CO2 is what we call direct air capture. It's essentially where we get CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. So it's kind of, you know, diffusely um, spread out in Earth's atmosphere. But we can use various materials. They could be solids or, or liquids, which are naturally chemically reactive. And so they will quite happily undergo a chemical reaction with CO2 gas molecules. And what happens then is they get converted into a solid form. So that then means that your CO2 is no longer a gas, and it's in the gas form that it contributes to climate change. If you could convert that into a solid, it could no longer contribute to that climate change. So CO2 utilization, um, this is a, a, another step in this CCUS process. Um, Usually this is where we're capturing CO2 as we're producing it. So maybe in a power station, for example, what we might call post-combustion capture. And once you purify that CO2, it can be reused very widely. A common use um, is, is food packaging, also to um, add the, the bubbles into beer or champagne, other sparkling beverages as well. Sometimes we need to then transport the CO2 from where we're capturing it to somewhere where it can be utilized or can be stored. Um, <coughs> excuse me. This, this transport is usually in, in pipelines. Uh, I just kind of want to briefly touch on this and that a couple of things we need to think about is pipelines can be expensive, but also vulnerable um, to, to attack um, as well. So I want to spend a bit more time talking about CO2 storage. So that's our last part in the CCUS process. And that's because that's really the kind of main part of the process where we as geoscientists um, can become involved. 
And we've got kind of two, uh, two options here. We convert our CO2 gas into a solid, um, so that's known as CO2 mineralization, or we can inject CO2 gas into some kind of underground storage location. And something that, that uh, geologists are, are looking at is, is using uh, former oil reservoir rocks. So these are rocks underneath the ground or underneath the sea from which we previously extracted oil and gas from. So we start with this uh, idea of CO2 mineralization, where we're turning this, the gas into a solid. A nice example of this is currently being tested in, in Iceland uh, in an old geothermal field. <coughs> Excuse me. So Iceland gets a lot of its energy from geothermal, and the rocks there are very hot. They're made of a rock called basalt, and that basalt's got lots of the chemical elements, calcium and magnesium in it. And that's the elements that we need in good quantities to react with our CO2 gas to then convert it into a solid. And that process we could kind of see in this diagram here, essentially we're injecting our CO2 gas along with some water deep down into the rocks underground, so our basalt rock. And what happens gradually is that CO2 reacts with the calcium and the magnesium in the basalt rocks to form new minerals. Essentially, the calcium and the magnesium are reacting with CO2 gas to make a solid form of CO2. Oops. And we can see this by maybe drilling a core down into these basalt rocks where we've injected CO2. And there's a photograph of one of these here. So the kind of purpley, greeny color is our basalt. But you can see in the kind of fracture that goes diagonally through the middle, there are some white crystals. And that's our evidence that our CO2, which we've injected, has been converted into a solid form. So that's a new mineral that's formed. And so that's the way that we can really kind of test the effectiveness of this process is by drilling these cores in and looking for evidence of that CO2 becoming mineralized, so turning from a gas into a solid. Now, obviously, we need to kind of monitor this to see if there's a, if trying to see how much of that CO2 is actually being stored there. So we need to look out for CO2 escaping from seeps in the ground around the area where we inject it. <coughs> Excuse me. So the other main um, approach that we have as geoscientists to CO2 storage is storing what we call supercritical CO2 in rocks. So the word supercritical essentially means uh, a substance like CO2 um, above its critical point. Now this just means uh, a temperature and pressure where gas and liquid are not separate, they're mixed. So for CO2, that point is about 31 degrees Celsius and seven uh, megapascals. That's a measurement of, of pressure. The key thing here is that once we go down into the ground, you know, once we go down into the subsurface, into the rocks, then the conditions of temperature and pressure are above this. And so our CO2 will become supercritical. So we can inject this supercritical CO2 into what we call these depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs. Now these are formations of rock underneath the ground or underneath the sea um, from which we have previously extracted oil and gas. Now when the oil and gas are extracted, um, the little spaces, little tiny pore spaces in the rock in which the oil and gas were held, they will just naturally fill up with water. But water is quite uh, has, has low viscosity, it's very runny, essentially. And so if we pump something else down into those rocks, like super, super critical CO2, that's going to push the water out of the way, meaning that the CO2 is then stored in the tiny little spaces in those rocks. So this uh, diagram here just kind of gives us a, a sort of cross-sectional view, looking down into the earth, we can see different layers of rock here. Um, and you can see the sort of a uh, cartoon figure of uh, like a drilling rig um, to make a uh, borehole, a well into which that CO2 can be injected. And then the CO2 may, tr may travel around in the rocks a little bit, very slowly, um, and then can be trapped in different types of rock deep down beneath the surface here. And so it then is effectively stored. 
So this is a, this second approach is something that we're looking at in, in Scotland and in the UK. Um, so, of course, we've got a long history of extracting oil and gas from underneath uh, the North Sea. And so we've kind of got all that infrastructure in place already. Uh, we've got oil rigs, wells and pipelines, the kind of stuff we need to transport the CO2 out there to then inject it beneath the surface. And so, you know, this idea of, of uh, CO2 storage underneath the, the sea, uh, the, the North Sea for, for us in, in Scotland and the UK, um, it's kind of becoming fairly well accepted um, in, in society, I think. And I guess probably a, a helpful, helpful aspect on that is because it's offshore underneath the sea, it's sort of like out of sight, out of mind almost. So I think people are a bit more, a bit more comfortable with that. So that's really just a kind of quick summary of uh, some of the stuff that, that we as geoscientists do that can help in the, the fight against climate change. And um, so I'll now pass you over to, to Cheryl, who's going to follow that up talking about uh, climate justice. Thanks, John. And it's really cool um, to hear what our colleagues do and what you could, you know, get involved in um, as, as a geoscientist. So it was really, uh, really great to hear um, that introduction. And of course, if there's any questions that come up um, eh, for John after the lecture, then, you know, maybe have a think of some um, and, and he can certainly try, <laughs> try and answer them. Um, so I think this point that John made at the end about being out of sight um, and out of mind is a sort of perfect segue into the issues that I'm going to cover in this second part of the lecture. And this part of the lecture turns, oh, I can get my slide, turns to think about um, climate justice in relation to our current climate crisis. And you might notice that the language changes a little bit in relationship to the conversations we're having. And that's part of the fact that John and I come from different disciplines and we come from different backgrounds, but we're exploring very similar Issues. So I will talk in the language of the climate crisis in a sort of different way of thinking about it in relationship to maybe climate change. So these kind of languages open up different kinds of possibilities for us. Now, climate justice is a fundamental concept in considering issues of climate change as it compels us to think about or to understand the challenges of individuals and communities most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And more than that, it informs how we um, should actually act in response to climate change. And so thinking through or thinking about climate justice allows us to explore both the worlds of those most impacted by climate change and their often very precarious situations, but to also explore the ways in which we live as individuals, as communities, societies and government bodies and how we respond to the threats posed by the climate crisis. And this reveals um, some very interesting, but also some very disturbing geographies. Now, issues of climate justice are often deeply bound to issues of climate action. Now, climate action comes in many different forms, um, but recently, as I'm sure many of you will know, and as John mentioned a little bit earlier on, we saw a range of activists across the world come to Glasgow to take part in COP26. And I'm sure those of you watching um, in schools, you would have covered and, and considered some aspects of COP26 as it was happening. Maybe some of you were activists as well. Um, and again, if you are, it'd be great to hear about your experiences um, after the lecture. Now, the United Nations Climate Change Conference, known as COP, brings together 197 nations and territories called parties from across the world to make decisions and agreements on climate change strategies and implementations. And so it becomes a really important space for different voices to be heard, often voices that are very critical of these parties' responses or perhaps lack of responses in relation to climate change mitigation. And many activists, including young people, and I think it's really important because hopefully we've got lots of young people watching um, today, young people are incredible activists. And we've seen this time and time again, and it comes through really, really loudly um, in our recent COP um, discussion. But many activists use the space of COP to allow their voices to be heard and to voice some of the injustices that their communities were facing. Now, very famously, Greta Thunberg um, has spoken very powerfully and critically about government responses to climate change, calling for more action to tackle key challenges. 
And this notion of action in relationship to climate change is really crucial, as many, especially young people, feel incredibly strongly that the time to act is now, before time runs out, before, as John highlighted in that graph, before it becomes too late to go back. But also that in not taking action, certain places and governments across the world are actively creating stark injustices allowing some places and some communities to pay the ultimate price for our worldly inaction. And so to achieve climate justice, we must have climate action. And for many people, we must advocate and uh, even fight very strongly for this. And as this quote from Anenza Grace, um, who is a Rwandan advocate who came um, to COP26 noted, she says, don't be afraid to show your colours in terms of achieving climate justice, because everyone everywhere has a voice and everyone everywhere has an ability to believe in change. And so thinking about climate justice is a highly geographical enterprise, as Burnham et al. state. They say the examination of climate justice dilemmas is fundamentally geographic, as they largely arise from the geographic mismatch between climate change causes and consequences across the surface of the planet. If we try to map the world, which many people have tried to do, in relation to aspects relating to climate justice, such as vulnerability, we can start to see the stark injustices of this global picture. On this map on the slide, which you might not be able to see too clearly, but hopefully um, you, you'll get the, get the feeling as we go through it, um, which you can see the most vulnerable countries um, are located in the so-called developing world. So those countries that are uh, put in colours of purple and red are the most vulnerable um, to the effects of climate change. And these countries that are most vulnerable are the countries that have contributed least um, to climate change. For example, over the last few years, two devastating cyclones swept through Mozambique, one of the world's poorest countries, killing hundreds of people and leaving millions of people in need of humanitarian support. This direct impact of climate change devastated a country, a country that has made a very small contribution to global emissions. So again, if we think about those graphs that John showed us before, and we think about the injustices of who's getting impacted and who's actually emitting them and producing them, we can start to see how stark um, a picture, how stark a geography it actually emerges. So questions arise such as, is it fair or just that some of the world's most poorest countries pay the price for wealthy countries' emissions and lack of engagement with climate change? Should the wealthy emitting countries do more to support efforts to overturn a planet on fire? These are the geographical questions at the heart of climate justice. And these geographies run deeper. If we have a, a think about not everyone experiences the impact of climate change equally, and this is really important for geographers to think about, we also have to think about the inequalities built into these geographies. Often it's the most vulnerable communities that experience the most harm, leading to really fierce geographies of inequality and injustice. If we take a look at this picture um, from the World Health Organization that they produced for COP26, it's who is at risk of climate change. And they go into more detail than just a map can present. So they talk about the idea that those living in poverty, and poverty is a really key concept for geography, but it's a really key concept to bear in mind when we're thinking about climate justice and we're thinking about climate change. So those living in poverty, and it tends to be women, it tends to be children, and it tends to be the elderly that suffer most from the impacts of climate change. It's outdoor workers and people living with chronic medical conditions. And it's children who are the most vulnerable due to the long-term exposure of environmental risks. And recent reports have come out to talk about the fact that climate change is actually um, a, a child um, issue. It's actually an issue of our time that we have to deal with because children's vulnerability is at stake. So this kind of idea that we can start to break down those geographies and think about them in a little bit more detail. Where people live is really important. So people living in mega cities, small islands, developing states and other coastal mountainous and polar regions are most at risk. 
and countries with weak health systems will be least able to prepare and respond. So this means when we're thinking about the geographies of climate justice, actually what comes into mind is issues of poverty, health, conflict, governance, colonialism, and many other aspects become really important when thinking about climate justice. So if we know that there are these stark injustices, and as John pointed out, we know that the climate is changing, we know that problems are emerging, just like the geoscientists were trying to come up with different kinds of solutions, what can we actually do to try not only understand climate justice a little bit more, but maybe actually alleviate it as well? And one way we can do this is to think about our own communities and the ways in which we can work together to actually challenge injustices. And schools are crucial spaces for raising and asking these important questions and for generating new ways of knowing and understanding the world. And one of the reasons why schools are such cool spaces to do this is because young people, yourselves, are the most inspiring and motivational force for challenging climate change, for challenging injustice. We need to be listening to you people because you will tell us what you need, what you think, and that's a really important step in us learning how you want your future um, to be. And so for a number of years, I've worked, I've been working with schools across the UK and Arizona um, on a project called the International Green Academy, which is a project that's designed to build school gardens in order to create spaces where young people can learn new vital skills to become confident ecological stewards. Through imagining, developing, building and growing in school gardens, we found that these are spaces bursting with radical potential. And so gardens and growing enable young people the opportunity to learn about climate justice through exploring their own connections to it. So by actually embedding yourself in thinking through climate justice or the injustices of climate change, we can actually start to find our way out of it. Okay, so this idea of doing becomes really important. So just in, as these pictures suggest, growing food, for example, allows conversations relating to food insecurity to arise and an engagement to develop around the inequalities prevalent in our own communities around food. So if you look at uh, that middle picture here, this was a school um, who wanted to grow their own food because they really wanted to send it out to local food banks because they knew, particularly through the pandemic, that communities were struggling, um, local communities were struggling to, to have access, especially to fresh food. So they were very keen to support their community um, through developing garden work. But it also enabled us to think more globally about issues of food production um, and shortages. And many, many young people at the moment reportedly feel hopeless and despair at the state of the planet, which is, has a term called ecological or climate anxiety. And what we found is that working in the garden has shown to be a productive and an important space for combating some of these feelings as more hopeful work takes place. So this idea of gardens as places of empowerment um, is really, really important. This notion that tackling the global challenges we face requires learning a range of practical skills for promoting ecological justice. So in the doing of garden work, you're actually promoting um, the thinking through and the development of a more uh, equal and just sense of um, the world. And in this project, we call these young people. So this young people, your young person, sorry, in this picture is actually developing a pumpkin patch um, and is very excited to be growing um, their own pumpkins, which they then gave out to the local um, community um, to do carving, to do eating, and need soup, all kinds of things. But this idea of what we would call these young people is we would call them world builders, um, people that are able to develop a set of skills to build new worlds that is crucial for, hope, for finding a hopeful way out of tackling climate injustice. And I want to talk to you a little bit about how, as geographers, we might theoretically think about that, which might sound like a scary word, but it's not, I promise. This is the kind of things you might do if you come 
to university. So in geography and in many other subjects at university, we often draw on theorists to help us to think about the wider implications of our arguments and to provide frameworks that we can use to help us to think more deeply about the issues that we're interested in researching. So we were researching school gardens and this International Green Academy project, and we wanted to think more about this idea of world building and world builders. Um, and so we turned to the political philosopher, Hannah Arendt, to try and help us to build a deeper understanding. Now, Hannah Arendt is a political philosopher um, who is used by many different geographers to help us understand our connections with and to the world. And she's written this book called the human condition. Now, you can pick up this book in all good bookshops, but it might be a little bit hard for you just now. Um, but certainly when you come to university, we would talk you through and discuss some of these arguments. And Hannah Arendt's work's really interesting because she advocates that actively engaging with doing something is vital for the persistence of human life and the survival of worlds. So if we want our planet and ourselves as humans to live on um, and to survive, we have to actively engage with something. So just like we talked about the fact that climate change and cli climate justice and climate action come together, climate justice has to be built on doing. It has to have something practical and active that can happen. And what she does is inspires this notion of what we call worldly work, which is work for the world. So rather than thinking about work as you might think, some of you might have a job, um, you might go and work to get paid. Actually, what we would think about is rather than working for what's known as capitalism, so money, we work for the world, we work for the community, we work to enable our school to be a more just and more hopeful place, for example. So you're not working for the system, for capitalism, you're actually working for the world. And Hannah Arendt helps us to think about this. And she helps us to think about this um, because she thinks about this idea of Amor Mundi. And Amor Mundi means love of the world. And she talks about it like this. She says, loving the world involves reconciling ourselves with the events of the past so that we can move about the everydayness of life, to go on living, to create, to find joy, to find perspective, to build new friendships, and to remind ourselves of where the possible remains. I mean, this notion of thinking about the possible is so important in the fight against climate change and climate injustice and something that we can never give up on, no matter how dark the media might present the situation. We must always think about what is possible. And what we found in our research is that gardens become these little big worlds where people take part in building new worlds, new futures, and new forms of climate justice. And you can see from some of these pictures, some of the activities um, that the young people did. So the first one up at the top is a, a bug hotel. So the, the young people designed a bug hotel so that they could have these creatures live safely in the school grounds and try to promote a nice really environment for them. So they literally built them a new world, which is very cool. Um, and uh, the other pictures show um, young people building raised beds to grow food again for their communities. And the final picture of the um, young person holding the worm is a really interesting story because when we started the garden, this young person hated worms absolutely hated them. We were digging up the soil. He hated them. He ran away from them. He thought they were disgusting um, in his words. But after we started to learn together about why worms were needed, what the soil was doing, how the soil was this life force between, be, beneath our feet, he suddenly became fascinated by worms and actually became, they became his friends. Um, he found families of them um, and became really connected to them. And we would talk about that becoming a solidarity, a solidarity between the human and the non-human um, that really kind of presented a different type of relationship and a different way of thinking about the world. As simple as that sounds, that can make a massive difference to the way that you think about what, where the world might go and what you might do in terms of climate change. So just to bring this section um, to a close, through our research with the International Green Academy, do we develop this school garden manifesto that you can see on the, the screen, which is built on the principles of world building. And part of this manifesto promotes notions of ecological and climate justice, seeing the garden and our environment 
more broadly as shaped by politics and therefore political spaces. So it's not just that people are taking part in gardening activities, which is great because it's fun and it's, it's really great, but it's more than that. It's this idea about the fact that if you're gardening in this way, you're making a political statement. You're making a, 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 a you're entailing climate action, um, the need to create more just and sustainable futures. And also this is the idea in the manifesto that the garden um, can become a space where the earth is actively defended. Our planet is under what's known as existential threat and so too is the human species. Our destiny together is shared. By caring for the earth through world building, we grow a better future, one that is more caring, more hopeful and more just for everyone. So hopefully what, we've ma what I've managed to show you in this small section is that attaining climate justice requires a commitment to challenging current injustices. So it's really important as geographers that we spot injustice, we find it, we dig it, literally dig it out of the ground. Because if we can see injustice, we can map it, we can find it, we can overturn it. Okay, so by looking for injustice, we can overturn it, which I think is a very powerful thing um, that geographers um, can do. And so we can see the climate crisis as a crisis of justice, as much as John presented it as a climate to our geophysical environment. So by seeing the two together, hopefully what you can see is it opens up different avenues for exploring and thinking and doing, but it also shares the same idea that we've got to change the world. We've got to promote um, and collectively start to imagine and build more hopeful and just world. So thank you so, so much for listening. I um, really hope that you've enjoyed, I certainly enjoyed oh, um, yeah. talking with everyone. Um, and we're now opening up to a Q&A session. Um, I'm not sure if we can actually see the chat, John, um, okay. but hopefully yeah, really somebody nice. can tell us if there's any questions. And I'd say these questions can be um, around what you've heard, but they can also be um, if you'd quite like to study um, geography or earth science here um, at Glasgow. Okay, so um, we just navigated over to the uh, live stream page uh, over on this other screen. So I'm just looking at the chat to see if there are any um, questions coming. Is this the... yeah, we've, we've got too many screens, I think, <laughs> on the go here. <laughs> okay, so we don't seem to have uh, any questions in the chat at the moment, but if anyone obviously wants to uh, ask any, um, you know, please do. And um, stick in the live chat. We'll uh, keep an eye out uh, yeah. for those. And um, yeah. so, John, can I ask you a question? As a say, I was a prospective student coming to you for an open day and wanting to come to Glasgow to do some of that carbon storage work, some of that, you know, geoscientist work. What would you recommend in terms of me thinking about a career in earth science? What would you recommend I think about or apply to, or or maybe get involved with? Okay, well, I mean, I think um, the, uh, so if you're coming to study uh, earth science, that'd be the subject you would um, study in, in your first and second years uh, here at Glasgow. Um, interestingly, actually, you would be applying for a subject with a slightly different name because we've got mm. two different types of geoscience degrees. There's one called geology and one called environmental geoscience. So geology is a sort of study of the whole earth in terms of its resources, its hazards, um, challenges that we face, for example, um, climate change, uh, and also thinking about, you know, what can we do about it? So kind of the, some of the stuff mm. I was talking there about um, CO2 mineralization. Our other programme is called Environmental Geoscience. Now, this is more focused at the Earth's surface. Uh, so as the name would suggest, thinking more about the environment, so mm. maybe thinking about concepts like how the landscape changes through time, mm. how we as humans, as well as natural forces, influence that landscape, cool. the water that's on it, maybe uh, challenges that we create. So, for example, things like pollution, mm. as well as linking in then to, to climate change as well. So our um, students who, who, who take one of these degrees and then they graduate, um, in terms of different careers they go into, um, a really wide range of things. So, for example, uh, 
common one uh, at the moment um, is kind of looking at environmental monitoring mm. and management. So kind of making sure that we as humans are, when we undertake industrial activities or development, that those activities don't then have a negative effect mm. on the environment. So we need specialist graduates to, to mm. look at those kinds of things. Um, but then there's also um, some of the maybe more traditional industries that are transitioning um, so, for example, you know, mining, if you think about mining, that sounds a bit like, oh, God, you know, environmental disaster. <laughs> no! <laughs> actually, for, for the kind of green green technologies and green transitions that, we, that, that we're going to need to implement, we actually need quite a lot of uh, quite rare metals. Hmm. And so it's really important for, um, for geoscientists to go into the into the world of work and really try and drive what we call a sustainable mining agenda so mm. going and getting these critical metals that we need for things like you know batteries for electric cars for example and mm. um, magnets and wind turbines um going and doing that and doing it in such a way where we cause very little environmental mm. degradation like really trying to minimize that that's really important and also there's um, things like the CO2 mineralization, carbon capture and storage. You know, this is something, again, where anywhere where we need a knowledge of the subsurface, the rocks beneath our feet, then we need, um, uh, you know, expert graduate mm. uh, geoscientists to, to deal with those kinds of things. Wow, so really bird's nine and a really important area of study. Yeah, um, I would say so. so yeah. yeah, so if you're thinking about it, you absolutely um, should check out our web pages, but also check out, um, you know, we have lots of virtual open days. Um, and hopefully one day open days back on campus too so yeah if you're interested absolutely come and chat more with us it would be great, yeah. great to do that any oh. questions no questions oh. yet uh, so i'm not seeing anything please ask us questions <laughs> <laughs> we're really happy to answer i'm them. not seeing anything coming in the chat um but don't worry about it actually so um you know some of you may actually be watching this um after the actual live stream it's going to yeah. be available on our youtube yeah. channel so you can find lots of great videos already on our youtube channel there's some stuff about um our different degree programs that it we is. have yeah. um there's also little uh, so i think we've got some mini lectures on there do, yeah and uh, there's also then some short videos about some of the kind of research interests of the different staff so you know shell you talked about the uh your the garden yeah uh, school garden here. research <laughs> yeah um and so so there's little videos like that little summaries and yeah. um, of some of the yeah. different research that the staff do across geography and earth science which yeah. is really nice um to look at so if you are watching this um later on uh, uh, so after it's it's been been live um you can get in touch uh, with mm -hmm. us on our, our social uh, social media channels uh, <laughs> even um i think there was also a, a new address that you had there on your is, last slide a, yes uh, there was on your last slide which are so, a jazz general email list which is on our main website yeah, that you can great so capture. you know if anyone's got i guess any questions about um yeah, about getting onto our degree programs, mm -hmm. um, then yeah. you can get in touch. Absolutely. Well, tell you what, Cheryl, seeing as you asked me about um, <laughs> uh, earth science, so geology, yeah. environmental geoscience, geography. why don't you tell us uh, something similar about, about geography then? Yeah, so I think geography, I mean, I think geography and why I'm a geographer is because I'm so passionate about challenging the most important issues that the world is facing. And these change over time. And I think we are at a position now where things such as climate change, the climate crisis is really dominating um, the world and what we're thinking about. So I think students that might want to study geography or anyone that's coming with a passion to change something, um, whether that be at a very small scale, whether that be globally, I think if you've just got this desire to make the world better, then I think geography is a great subject. Um, and you can come and study geography at Glasgow through three different pathways. So whether you're uh, want to come through the science route, you want to come through the arts route, or the social science route. Geography is available in all three of them, um, and it's a great, it's a great, it's the same course that you will do. You will do bits of science, bits of arts, bits of social science all together. Um, and I think that gives you a really great portfolio of skills, a great portfolio of ideas that you can then take out, and our students do take out across the world into different careers so yeah i definitely think um coming to study geography at glasgow is a really exciting 
degree mm. program. Um, it's a really challenging degree program. We cover all the different issues um, that you know we are facing, uh, which I think is, is is a really fantastic opportunity. So yeah, I think one of the really positive things about geography is you don't have to just enjoy one thing. Mm. You can enjoy a multitude of things and bring your passion into the degree so we're definitely I know some people are writing personal statements and so mm. really thinking about what they want to study and I would just say if you've got a passion if you've got a drive get that down on your personal statement um, and just really make sure that you're really thinking about about what it is that you want to do so yeah we just encourage lots of people are geographers and they don't know it yet <laughs> <laughs> John you're a geographer you just don't know it yet <laughs> well I mean I guess it's, it's worth noting actually Ed. so um you know I'm sure some of you might have looked into this already or, or you may be kind of thinking about university in, in the mm. near future um so if you come and study at a Scottish university like Glasgow then you would take uh more than one subject in your first year uh, and indeed in your second year, so it's three subjects in the first year and then two in, in yeah. second year before you then choose your kind of specialty, so like geography or environmental geoscience or, or geology yeah. in, in third and fourth year. And it's, I think like like you said, Cheryl, it's very, the, the subjects are, are kind of close and quite complementary. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And so it's, it's really common, actually. Um, popular subject combination for yeah. our students to take Definitely. earth science and geography in yeah. first and second year and then yeah. you know another subject as well perhaps yeah in, and I think a lot of our year. students come back and tell us that was a real strength that helped them build different skills but also because we are one school so we are in different buildings across the university but we're the same school so often what you'll find is that we're sharing ideas people are teaching across the degree program mm -hmm. so you get to know the staff really really well um, which I think is, is students have often said is a really great mm -hmm. way to you know connect with people students often do them together as well so you get the same friendship groups mixing across yeah. the two degrees as well um so yeah there's a lot of strength that can be drawn and i hope this lecture has shown that that if you take john's knowledge and you take mine and you put them together that's an incredible catalog of things that you can change the world with so i think that that is where um these two subjects unite and and really complement mm -hmm. one another I guess it's also worth saying, you know, some of you watching this may well be from Glasgow, but I think it's yeah. worth pointing out that Glasgow is a really great city to, to study geography or earth science, yeah. uh, for, I, mean, we, I guess for different reasons from an earth science perspective, where we, we look at a kind of range of topics, everything from studying rocks and how they form, uh, through to challenges posed by things like past industrial activity. Mm. Glasgow is in a really wonderful location for that because we've got the kind of landscapes and mountains and, and rocks of <laughs> lots of different kinds, you know, a really short distance away mm. from where we are. We're really lucky in that respect. Um, but then also there's the kind of angle of um, how humans in the Glasgow area have then influenced the landscape, what mm. effects that's had, how's that, how has that impacted the environment, sort of legacy of, of mm. past industrial activity through pollution, for example. Yeah. really fascinating almost like a sort of natural laboratory i suppose yeah. in which to yeah. in which to to study um to study the subject i mean i guess in terms of geography there's so many physical and human issues wrapped yeah. in together in, in yeah. glasgow would you say i think glasgow is that laboratory it helps us to get students to think about the issues that are affecting the world and in a way that is doable so they can get out there they can think about it um, and Glasgow is a very global city as well so the connections that Glasgow has some problematic of course um, that we can investigate um, is, is a really important way of opening up our conversations in geography because obviously we're not just talking about one place we're talking about the world so I think it, it Glasgow is a really great city for uh, you know it's also a great city to live in oh, <laughs> we both live yeah. here yeah, yeah. Um, and it's our students really tell us that <laughs> you know, it really gives them a great student experience as well. So, yeah, Absolutely. if you haven't been to Glasgow, come for a visit when you can. Um, and uh, yeah, it would be great, great to see you. Mm. Oh, we got oh, some questions. Got a oh, question yes. coming up Thank in you. the uh, live chat. Uh, so we've got a question here. How long are the courses? So in terms of the degree programme as a whole, um that would be four years yep. is the is the, the standard length each degree program of course is made up of, of various different courses yep. um typically these would last for anything between i would say maybe five weeks through to maybe 10 weeks mm -hmm. um at different uh, parts of the year with the kind of core teaching and you know your lectures tutorials labs those kinds of things running yep. sort of january to april uh so that's 
well, I get October to December and then January, January to, to April. April. Yeah. Um, and I think yeah. one of the things, if you're not from Scotland or familiar with the Scottish system, um, you'll notice that Scottish degree programmes tend to be four years um, in contrast to English degree programmes, which tend to be three years. Now, four years, I think, is a real strength of the Scottish mm. system. Um, I have, for many, many years, have been an advisor of studies, which is a, a person who supports um, students through their studies and what tends to happen is that four years give students the opportunity not only to learn an incredible amount um, throughout their degree and build their, their skill set uh, more greatly, but it also allows you to make a mistake. <laughs> so it allows you to study those three subjects in your first year, maybe the one you came to do you don't actually like as much as you think you are, but you have two other subjects that you can carry on into your degree. Um, and I think that that stops this process of maybe making a mistake, having to withdraw your studies, having to reapply. Um, so I think what this, the four-year system does, it allows you to explore more widely ideas and issues and skills, but also allows you to make a mistake. And I think that's a wonderful thing um, to do, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm just typing a response there as well. So you've got a yes, type sure. on as well as that. As that. <coughs> Great. Yeah, well, if we've got any last questions, otherwise maybe. Yeah, I think we can we um, wrap probably up. Uh, wrap this up. Yeah, yeah, but I think we just want to say thank you for Absolutely. coming along. And as you, many people we know are going to watch it later on um, when they have the time or when they, they're starting to think about their university, perhaps their university life. Um, but we would just really encourage people to get in touch. And we really do want to hear from you if you're keen to study here, but also just if you are working on issues relating to what we're talking about and you want to know a little bit more, then again, we'd be really keen to hear from you. Yeah, check out our social media channels. Uh, so obviously we're on YouTube, um, also our um, Instagram and Twitter. I think they're both at yep. U of G G E S. Um, and so, you know, you can see some little snippets on those channels as well yeah. about the kind of stuff that we get up to and little bits about courses yeah. as, as well. Well, thank you so okay. much, everyone. Take thank care. Um, we'll see you again soon. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye.